Uh, good after afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Morris Federation series of events during lockdown. And today we have Kurt Linton Morris, who are going to tell us a bit about their history and also do a workshop. Um, so John Mayo is going to be the MC. And if you have any questions, if you could put them in the chat to John Mayo and he will field those questions. Um, but first, we're going to start with a musical introduction from John Leslie. So I'm handing over to John Leslie now. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, and thanks for joining Curtinton Morris this afternoon. Um, I'm John Leslie, one of the Curtinton Morris musicians. Um, so to start the proceedings, I'm going to play four of our dance tunes. Uh, first is the Crooked Postmaster. Uh, the dance was devised by our foreman, Dylan Brown, who you'll meet later on. It will probably be obvious to most of you that the tune is a take on Adderbury's Postman's Knock. Second is Lumps of Plum Pudding. Uh, this is our usual signature starting dance. Uh, no notes of the original choreographic, choreography survive and it's a reconstructed dance by Paul Davenport, who again you'll hear from this afternoon. The next one is Pigeon Lock. That was born out of a workshop we did at Whitby Folk Festival in 2014. It's an adaptation of the Bucknell tune, Black Joke. Also, it's a tune from the Adderbury Morris repertoire. And lastly, Is Iswa Off. It's our farewell dance. Uh, the tune is called Town Green. And the dance was composed by Tim Radford, who again you'll meet later. Um, it was written by him while the team were dancing in Iswall, France. Tim says it took him literally a couple of minutes to write. Um, it's a simple dance to say goodbye. Lastly, uh, you can find all the parts of our tunes either on my Facebook page, which is John Leslie, or the Curtis and Morris Facebook page. Um, and please do visit our web page where a number of the tunes and other information can also be found. Thank you and uh, I hope you enjoy the tunes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks, and uh, going to hand you back to our MC, John Mayo. Hi there, my name's John Mayo. I've been dancing with Kirtlington for almost 30 years since moving to Oxfordshire. Um, for our workshop today, we've got a selection of uh, talks, videos, and an opportunity to learn and practice this unique style. It is characterized by angular arm and leg movements, a hay that starts backwards, and the huckleback step. If you have any questions or comments during the presentations, please direct them to me in the first instance via the uh, chat feature on Zoom, which I think is down here. Um, and I'll do my best either to respond back by chat or there'll be some short breaks after the, each presenter where we can refer any questions to them and I'll, um, I'll drive the questions. Um, first of all, we've got Bob, Davin, uh, Bob Dunlop, who's going to begin by outlining the history of um, Morris and Curlington Lamb Ale. Uh, we have a video from Paul Davenport who reconstructed the tradition followed by Tim Radford who helped put the steps into practice. Then our squire Nigel Holt will give a talk about Len and Barbara Berry who were key in bringing the tradition to life with dances and music and then the practical part of the workshop by Dylan who's our foreman who will present um, the workshop to demonstrate the steps with opportunities to try for yourselves. Uh, John Leslie is going to be on hand to play any uh, any uh, tunes that we uh, we need. So going to cut over to Bob now, um, who's going to talk about the history and I'm going to be doing the slides for him. Hello. I'm talking about the history of Morris Kirtlington. How did it all start? What I present here is a mixture of facts, evidence and some wild speculation. It rests very heavily on the shoulders of giants of Morris research, John Forrest, Michael Heaney, Keith Chandler, and specifically on the work of those who revived the Curtinton tradition, Paul Davenport, Tim Radford, Lennon Barbara Berry, and we'll hear more from and about them later. Curtington is a small village 12 miles north of Oxford, population about 500 in 1801, which is about a quarter of the size of Bampton and Shimmel Adderbury. There's a long tradition of Morris dancing associated with the Curtington Lamb Ale which is dated around Trinity Sunday, the week after Whitson. In the early half of the 19th century, this was a big event. There was a week of celebrations featuring feasting, drinking, rural sports and games, amongst these Morris dancing. Presiding over the events were the Lord and Lady of the Lamb. There was an implicit inversion of the social order while the Lord or Squire or Fool, who may or may not actually have been the Squire of the Morris as well, um, presided and the lady was treated with reverence. The local team of 12 lads toured the village and surrounding areas. A typical performance involved three dances, one with handkerchiefs, one with sticks and one hand clapping. One source says there were 14 dances in total, one and a half were actually preserved and recorded. A bower was established, sometimes a converted or decorated barn, which was a venue for dancing, drinking and feasting. There was a Morris dance competition attracting up to 20 visiting sides. Bampton traveled the 20 miles on horseback. Bucknell were regular attenders. Headington's foreman, Joseph Trafford, recalled 30 years later the song and the tune, which is a variant of Saturday night, that we used for the dance competition, which was done with sticks and with hankies. It, it was claimed that Headington always won. We go to the first picture, please. This is a Kirtlington dancer. It comes from a publication in 1912, um, but it depicts a dancer which costume historians have reckoned to be from about 1835, pretty much in the 19th century heyday of the Lamb Ale. Thank you. On to the second picture. This is the Morris dance, comp, Morris comp costume, which is held by the Pitt Rivers Museum. It was acquired by uh, Percy Manning's researcher, Thomas Carter. 
Michael Heaney has written extensively on it. You can find his article on the web, and it is largely a Kirklington costume. Thanks very much. Back to me now. Social mores changed in the 19th century. The disorder, drunkenness, and sexual license associated with lamb ale became unfashionable. In 1858, the Dashwood family, the local gentry at Kirklington Park, ceased making a financial contribution. The last old style lamb ale took place probably in 1863. It was replaced by a village club day feast. There were three subscription clubs. There was a fun fair, a brass band, processions, fancy dress, but Morris dancing was no longer a central part of the festivities and it very much declined. Next picture, please. This is the first known photograph of Kirtlington Lamb Ale. It dates from 1884, it shows the Bista brass band outside the Oxford Arms. Next picture, please. This is slightly later, probably about 1905, and it's the procession led by the band to the church with girls in costume, um, giving something of the flavor of the club feast, La Male. Okay, back to me. So how old is the Morris tradition? A written account by Hearn from 1723 cites the La Male as an annual event and an account book from 1732 of the Dashwood family cited a payment of five shillings to Kirtling Morris for their dancing at Lamb Ale. This is a payment to a local side of indigenous performers, implicitly not full-time professionals brought in from elsewhere, but associated with a local seasonal event. 45 years earlier, in 1679, a publication by Thomas Blunt gives more detail. Fragmenta Antiquitatis, ancient tenures of land and jocular customs of some manners. Is in fact, not still not the full title. Of this, Keith Chandler says, the earliest source to provide specific details of the format of ales refers to the lamb ale held at Kirtlington during the 1670s. The account elaborates certain features of the various forms of diversion which might be found. And if we can put up the text now, this is the text of the quotation from, uh, thanks John, uh, fr from uh, Blunt, from Thomas Blunt. The custom is that on Monday after Whitson week, there is a fat live lamb provided and the maids of the town having their thumbs tied behind them run after it, and she that with her mouth takes and holds the lamb is declared lady of the lamb, which being dressed with the skin hanging on is carried on a long pole before the lady and her companions to the green attended with music and a morisco dance of men and another of women, where the rest of the day is spent in dancing, mirth and merry glee. The next day the lamb is part baked and roast for the ladies' feast, where she sits majestically at the upper end of the table and her companions with her, music and other attendants, which ends the solemnity. The tying of girls' thumbs is not an aspect we've managed to revive. Back to me now, please. Um, this is, so what can we make of this reference? This is a two-day annual event of ancient origins. Thomas Blunt was a well-off lawyer and a zealous Catholic. He died in the year of the book's publication. Next picture, which is the girls chasing the lamb. This is the first known illustration of lamb ale, events of around 1679, as interpreted in 1822. The race by local girls depicted was dismissed by 19th century commentators as unlikely. Perhaps the details an exaggeration. Perhaps we can take from it the fact that there was competition to choose the lady, who then had an important role in subsequent celebrations. Thanks very much. Back to me. The explicit reference to a Moresco of women is interesting. It has been challenged. 
It's not an isolated instance. 26 years later in 1705, and just five miles away when the foundation stone of Blenheim Palace was laid at Woodstock, quote, there were several sorts of music, three Morris dances, one of young fellows, one of maidens, and one of old bell dames. There's no reason to believe that these dancers at Woodstock were the Curtlington dancers. They could have been from anywhere. Perhaps they were professional performers. But it means that local female Morris dancers were around the area at the time of the first written references to dance at Curtlington. So, if Lamail and its associated Morris dancing was an established ancient custom in 1679, when did it start? The correct answer, and thank you to QI for this, is nobody knows. But we've got lockdown, we've got time to indulge in a little speculation. 1679 is 19 years after the restoration of the monarchy under Charles II in 1660, which itself was accompanied by merrymaking and many instances of Morris dancing. Could this have been the foundation of Kirklington Lamb Ale? It's possible. Not sure that this would qualify it as an ancient custom just 19 years later. Perhaps it was revived after 1660. Much Morris activity was suppressed during the interregnum, although there are some instances of records of Morris activity. These are often indoor private performances in the homes of sympathetic gentry. Perhaps it's more likely that the ancient ritual of a lamb ale and associated Morris at Kirklington is older than this from before the interregnum. Records of Whitson ales are fairly sparse. They've been analyzed by John Forrest. Could we put up the John Forrest diagram, please? Most of these records reflect action to suppress them. They seem to be at the center of a religious divide between the old Catholic religion and Protestant and Puritan movements. The association of Morris and Catholicism isn't absolute, but perhaps indicative as associated with old rituals and ceremonies. Blunt was Catholic and Kirklington Parish was associated with the old religion. The peak time in the 16th, 17th centuries for reports of ales turns out to be around 1570, with just under 60 ales reported. And the peak for contemporary linked references to Morris dancing is around 1600. These do not, of course, reflect peak times for the first establishment of these events, which would have been substantially earlier. So, what does this suggest of the possible origin of Morris at Kirklington? It tells us very little. Does the fact that Kirklington Lamb Ale was a big event in 1800 imply it would have been so 200 years earlier? No, not reliably. Although Blunt's reference is to something that's a bit special. If, Kirt if Lamb Ale was like other wits and ales, then perhaps we're looking at something that might have been happening in 1600, perhaps in 1550, perhaps even earlier than that. So what would it have looked like? Next picture, please, John. This is the image of the Dixton Harvesters. It's part of a larger painting in Gloucestershire Museum depicting harvest. It's been tentatively dated to around 1725. And now the detail picture, the next one. And here we have the Morris dancers who are tucked away in a corner. Morris here is rural, seasonal, local and vernacular. They're rural people, they're not professional dancers. They're involved in harvest and rural life. The dancers have similar costumes, whites with ribbons. Um, they seem to be performing the same steps and movement. Probably Morris at the time of the first written record at Kirklington could have looked something like this. Next picture, please. If we're going back a hundred years or so, 
This is the Thames at Richmond. It's a picture in the Fitzwilliam Museum. If we're looking at dancing about 1600, uh, it's actually 1620 this, I think. Um, here we have some dancers. They've got a common step, which looks a bit like a Morris step. There are some different costumes suggesting characters, the lady and the hobby horse. The dance is in line. Perhaps the first dancing of Morris at Kirklington could have looked something like this. Next picture, please. This is the ring dance from Israel von Mechenen, who is from Germany, and it's dated to about 1475. It's somehow not very plausible that Morris at Kirklington could ever have looked like this, only in part because it's obviously a caricature. This is a court dance depicted in an engraving. The figures are grotesque, lewd, exaggerated, athletic, we're probably looking at professional performers, acrobats or jesters. This is individual dance performance, a drama where dancers are vying for the attention of the lady. Name the ring dancer to circle dance around the lady with no hint of a long way set. It seems highly unlikely that the first Morris at Kirklington could have looked anything like this. It's very different in context. But if the lamb ale had its origins in the early 16th century, could any associated Morris have been a rural interpretation of something like this? Could we go to the next picture, please, John? I think there could be one clue. This is a familiar, probably one of the earliest Morris photographs. It's Bucknell in 1875. Lots of Morris traditions include, of the maid of the, include a maid of the mill type dance around the lady. Kirtlington was a tradition that was associated with a selected lady who was revered as the mistress of the revels. Front left here is Eli Rolf, who told Cecil Sharp in the early years of the 20th century that Kirtlington used to dance Bonnie Green around the lady of the lamb. Next picture, please, which leads to the dance that we perform today at the revived Kirklington Lamb Ale each year. Here we see Kirklington dancing Bonnie Green in 2016 around Bella Timms, Lady of the Lamb. So could this dance be some last vestigial trace, a last hint, of a very ancient dance form. As I say, it's speculation, but that's back to me, thank you. Thank you for listening. I'll leave you with that question. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up just yet. So um, next I'd like to present to you um, a short video from um, uh, Paul Davenport and uh, he can explain um, a little bit on how he re reconstructed the uh, tradition. Hi Kettlington, my name is Paul Davenport and sometimes known as The Culprit and I've been asked to put down a few of my reminiscences as to how exactly we got this thing started back in 1979. In the early 1970s I was the squire of the fledgling Green Oak Morris men in Doncaster and being the kind of individual that I am I really wanted my team to be as traditional as possible and that meant as far as I was concerned not dipping into a bit of Bampton, a bit of Atterbury, a bit of Headington but rather having one tradition that we danced like the old teams used to and the problem was that at that time in history Let's say the, the powers that be were very hostile to the idea of making up your own dances. So basically I started looking for a dance tradition that nobody danced and that we could set the world alight with. Anyway, nothing happened until Lionel Bacon's Aid Memoir of Morris Dancing appeared in 1974 
And when I flicked through that, I found a tradition called Kirtlington. Nobody asked it. It was really quite famous and yet it was extinct. So I set about looking at that particular tradition, which in Lionel's book consisted really only of one dance, a jig and some intriguing starting points, shall we say. So over a period of time, maybe the next two years, I started looking for information on the dances. I looked at Manning, I looked at the Esperance Morris book because it turns out Buttery Pierman, William Pierman that was, uh, one of the existing Kirtlington dancers had danced for Mary Neal. I looked at um, Butterworth's Diary of Morris Dance Hunting which was very interesting and eventually I got a list of dances that might have been danced. Then it was a question really of working out how we were going to make this legitimate. So it wasn't that hard. If you look at the existing evidence we know that Kirtlington and Bucknell shared a musician from time to time so it wasn't beyond the bounds of possibility to suppose that they maybe shared some dances. We also knew that Saturday night had been a competition dance set at the Kirtlington Lamale back in the ancient times. So naturally one would conclude that the Bucknell tune would fit the Kirtlington dance and, and whatever Bucknell were doing was very similar to Kirtlington. And so that kind of um, extrapolation, shall we say, made, made the, the, the body of dances that you know as a, as a Morris team, um, or at least the core of those dances. Incidentally, from 1979, when I had contacted the vicar of Kirtlington and he had put me in touch with the scoutmaster, one Len Berry, uh, the history of which you know about, we had been going down to the village every fortnight during the winter and I would teach the lads that kept that Leonard got together. I teach them the dance, um, a new dance each week from the Green Oak repertoire, and and the very formidable Tim Radford from uh, Adderbury would crack the whip in the interim period to make sure that the standard was high. Actually, Tim and I must have been hated at some point because we were very demanding taskmasters, and. Uh, <laughs> and it remains the fact that Curlington to this day, I think, uh, uh, certainly on a good day, are one of the finest teams that you will ever see anywhere. Um, yeah, and, and I think Tim and I should take some credit for that because we were pretty horrible at times. Anyway, so that was basically where we were. And then in 19, 1980, well, 1979, uh, Green Oak came down to Curlington and we danced with um, Adderbury and and another team that I can't remember, but we had a, a really good knees up at, at lunchtime on the Sunday in the, uh, in the Dashwood Arms. And subsequently, um, well, the rest you know, a year later, the, the Kirtlington team danced out for the first time in what was probably about 100 years. And, uh, and I, 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 was, I felt very privileged to be part of that. Um, I, I met people like... Um, Harry Pierman, the last, the last of the Pierman family. If you, if you want to know what Harry looked like, I'm afraid the only photograph is, uh, is of the family with Caroline, his grandmother, and a little boy in Lord Fauntleroy kind of clothes, Sunday best. That was Harry, um, who sadly died in 1980. So, yeah, um, Len and Barbara were really the the key to it all, and instrumental in. Um, in, in getting the thing alive and and Tim and I just supplied the the, the research and the, and the and the technique really and uh, yeah and I, I from 1980 when we, we danced again at the, at the first revived Lamb Ale um, from 1980 to 94 5 I never went back to Curlington uh, and when I did I sneaked in uh, one one Lamail Sunday, sneaked in and parked on the North Green and was utterly amazed at the size 
of this thing and what it had become. So yeah, um, that's really all I have to say. And you know, thank you for listening, if in, if indeed you have been listening and not fallen asleep on this. Um, there is the Morris Ring do actually have all my notes and research in a, a little pamphlet called uh, Kirtlington: The Archaeology of a Tradition, which you can get see photographs of the Pierman family, and and the justification for my, uh, shall we say, reinvention of of the uh, of the Kirtlington dances from the 19th century. Anyway, thanks very much. Stay safe and hope to see you all again soon and out there dancing. Cheers. Interesting talk there from uh, Paul and um, hot on the heels with Paul. I, I can uh, pass you over now to Tim Radford. Hello everyone. Um, the Kernington Revival story. So what exactly were the influences in the revival of Morris Dance in the village of Kernington? Firstly, we should not forget the part taken by the Oxford University Morris. Before there was even an inkling of the village revival, the Oxford men had for years been dancing at the annual Amal celebrations. That at that time mainly consisted of the arrival of a two-day fun fair on the village green, a feast on the Monday organised by the village, and a cricket match on the playing field. The Oxford University uh, always danced at least one or two Kernington dances as they perceived them. Now I'm going to share my screen there to show a picture of them. And share. There's a picture of them outside the old village hall, no longer in existence. I think there's two buildings on it now. Okay. I wish I knew who the dancers were. I don't. Okay, stop to share. Back to me. To really understand what happened at that time of the revival, we must think of Len and Barbara Berry and their place locally in, in not only the village community, but also the folk song community. I first met Len and Barbara at folk events they organised in the old village, wooden village hall that you saw earlier, and at other events around Oxfordshire. In the mid-1970s, there were regular folk music and singing events at several um, places. Curtington Village Hall, Killingworth Castle Pub in Wooten, the Prince of Wales Folk Club in Banbury, the Tiddy Hall Concerts in Ascot under Witchwood, Bister Folk Club and Oxford Folk Club. They are the ones that come to mind first. Many of the singer, singers and musicians that attended these events, and um, beside the performances, there was always talk about Morris traditions. In 1975, the only Morris teams in Oxfordshire, other than the remaining tight-knit traditional teams at Hennington, Bampton and Abingdon, were Oxford City, Oxford University, Towersey, Ignil Way in Wantage, and in the south of the county, but actually in Berkshire, the Kennet men. There were no teams in the northern half of the county. The revival at Atterbury was first in 1974-75 and this provoked interest in other places. Those who became involved were nearly all part of the folk song scene or in some way related to Oxford City Morris. I think I met Helen Corden Lee and her partner Charlie the first week I moved to Oxfordshire in 1973 and they were prime movers at Buckingham. It was at Oxford City where I met Dave Townsend and Mike, Town, Mike, Mike Heaney and later Robin Saunders at song events. They all had a hand in the Ensham revival. Then there was also Ian Giles and Keith Dandry, children involved at Ducklington, both regular song participants. Another person we got to know at the time was Mick Jones at Wheatley. They too had a revival at the same time. Similarly, we all knew John Townsend from Ask Under Witchwood, and I tried to get something going there without success. And finally, one of Dennis Manners' sons of Tarazi was living in Chadlington, and we tried to persuade him and some of his friends to do something either at Ask Under Witchwood or at Bledington, all to no avail. I'd been badgering Len and Barbara about the Curlington dancers after we revived at Atterbury, but it took some time for it to happen. However, the event that really prompted the positive movement in Kirkington was the interest shown by Paul Davenport 
as you've heard already, of Green Oak, uh, Morris in Doncaster, in around 1977. He thought that because Kirtlington was such an important place in the history of Morris in the South Midlands, with the lamb owl, etc., why doesn't it have a team now? He took the core dancers from the tradition, effectively only two, Trunkles and Old Woman, and synthesised others into using the dancers from Bucknell as a possible similar tradition. He worked on the dancers with the team and wrote a paper about Kirtlington and its dancers. This he sent to Len Berry, and this started the ball rolling. Len spoke to me about it. We both spoke to Roy Dolmet and asked his opinion. Roy immediately sent me all his notes on Curlington, and it was agreed that to promote interest in the Curling in Curlington, both Green Oak Morris and Atterbury Morris men would dance in the village at the upcoming Lamb Ale weekend in June 1979. This proved to be quite a success, but what should we do to move forward? It was agreed that Len, with his village persona and relationship with the local skate troupe, would recruit as many villagers as he could as dancers. Barbara would provide music for the new team that arose. I agreed to teach the new recruits on a weekly basis and would use Paul Davenport's dances and probably Roy Domit's notes as a basis of style and dances for the new team. The team practiced for a year the five or six basic dances in Paul's manual. I had had similar experiences with the Atterbury revival, but for me, the most interesting factor was that at Atterbury, most of our recruits nearly all came from the folk world. At Curlington, I found it more different, difficult, different, as most dancers were just local villagers with very little folk experiences. We were lucky to have Ian Harris and Tim Lawton, both Atterbury men, who took and it, but it took longer to teach the dancers than I had expected in Atterbury. However, by the next Curlington Lamau in 1980, much expanded by Len and Barbara and the village helpers, the team was ready to perform. Barbara, with help from some village ladies, was able to devise and teach the maid's dance. And with all the accoutrements of the old 19th century lamb owls, forest feathers, lamb pies, the bower, beer, the Lord and Lady, church services and processions, the revival was on, June 1980. Now I'm going to share a screen again and show a picture of that team in all their glory. Ah, wrong one. There they are in all their glory. And I think the only person who's still involved at all peripherally with the team is Tim Lawton, who um, is, the, is at the centre uh, of the three kneeling people in the front. Ian Giles is still around and comes along in that on occasion, but I think everybody else is uh, uh, gone to the winds, shall we say. Okay, stop share. Back to me. The newly revived Curlington Morris dancers uh, danced on their own around the village on the Saturday and then up to 15 other teams were invited to dance on Sunday around the village with the church service, procession and displays. At the school, Len set up an exhibition at the school of all the information he had amassed on the village traditions. The tradition, the tradition was then begun to invite teams at no charge and to bribe them with at least a gallon of free beer. A good time was had by all. At no time did I then, nor wish to, dance with the team. After that first practice year, I left them to their own devices and did not come back to the team as a dancer until I was invited by Ian Harris, then Squire, sometime in late 1970, 1985. I continued to dance with the team until I left to move to the United States in 1996. I did take on the position of foreman again in 1992 and with my new wife, Jan Elliott, who became one of the musicians. During my time with the team, we had some amazing experiences. The trip to the USA in 1990 is the most important to me as it changed my life forever. However, other events when I was with the team also stand out. Dancing at the International Folk Festival at Eastwire in France. Also as a guest 
display team at Sidmouth Folk Festival and other folk festivals. At that time, Curtington were dancing more frequently than Atterbury. So pub dance spots in the late 1980s and early 1990s were always happy events. I always used to say that Atterbury, uh, Curtington was my love, but Atterbury was my passion. Both Lamel, but Lamel was always the focus of the yearly events. Dancing with friends from across the Morris world continues to create a buzz every time. It's been a long, long time since my involvement, but memories are warm, long, and very, very deep. I will just show you one more photo. Uh, again, wrong one. That This is a photo of me dancing with Carrington at the Donkey House in Windsor, just to prove that I did dance with the team and that I could do it at the time. Those days are too long past. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to everyone and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, show. I'm going to sit back and listen. Thank you very much. Over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I've been answering a couple of questions in the background. Um, so there's nothing to ask any presenters uh, so far. So next for you, we've got our squire, Nigel Holt, who's going to talk about Len and Barbara Berry. So over to you, um, Nigel. Okay, thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, uh, Tim, for that. Uh, my talk uh, overlaps a little bit with Tim because I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about Len and Barbara Berry. Um, as you know, I'm Squire of Kirtlington Morris and have been for... Um, more longer than most people would care to remember quite frankly but um, at least I've got quite a few memories of uh, Len and Barbara and uh, and of course since since then anyway I'm going to take a Barbara who were as you know instrumental in the revival or as Paul would have it the reconstruction of the Kirtlington tradition can I pick one please John Okay, Len and Barbara moved to Kirtlington, I think probably after they'd got married in the early 1950s. They rang folk sessions in the old wooden village hall and were well known locally on the folk scene as the Portway Peddlers. Uh, they, got their, um, they got their name, the Portway Peddlers, from the, uh, an old uh, way an old road which joined up with Aikman Street, which is the uh, Roman road, which which runs very close to um, very close to to Kirtlington, and they called themselves the Portway Peddlers to have a bit of local flavour. Uh, one, uh, one or two of you might actually have a copy of their first record or cassette tape. If you remember those, it was called In Greenwood Shades, and it was released in 1984. Barbara wrote or arranged most of the tunes on piano and piano accordion to accompany a collection of traditional Oxfordshire song lyrics for which some tunes had never been recorded. And of course they both sang. Len had a particularly fine folk voice. Paul and Tim have told you already how Len and Barbara played an important part in the revival of the Kirtlington side and Len's scout troop, which unbeknownst to them, would form the core of the new side and Barbara writing or adapting tunes for the five new dances. Here's a picture of Len and Barbara in their finery from 1982. Len had become the first squire of Kirtlington Morris and Barbara was naturally the musician. She wrote some original tunes, especially for the side, and they remained a squire and musician for the first few years until others were able to step forward. Incidentally, our repertoire has continued to grow and we now have well over 30 dancers to choose from, dances, I beg your pardon, to choose from, including the original five, and at least one dance, Jockey to the Fair, which has faded back into the mists of time because no one can quite remember it. It is believed that Tim Lawton, who was uh, mentioned a little earlier, was the last to dance Jockey to the Fair, but now it's forgotten, it's that old. Big four, please, John. Nice picture of the side here from 1983, taken during a tour of Wheatley on their annual day of dance. 
Lennon and Barbara uh, remained popular figures in the village until they retired to Chirk in North Wales in the mid-1990s, but they continued to visit at La Mail time and take their places at the top of the table at the La Mail feast until about 2005, when travelling long distances became too difficult. They made ends meet in Chirk by offering bed and breakfast, but their lives were made rather more comfortable when it was discovered by Gordon Potts, who some of you will know. I believe he worked for the Performing Rights Society. Uh, he discovered that a tune that Barbara had written in the 1970s for A Wandered by a Brookside and recorded on In Greenwood Shades had been assumed to be a traditional tune and it was appeared uh, on a posthumous hit album by the American folk singer Ava Cassidy. Anyway, significant royalties had accrued and Len and Barbara's life was made considerably more comfortable. Pick five, please, John. This pick was taken in 2010 when Curlington Morris visited the Berries in Chirk when Len first became ill with Alzheimer's. We toured the town, triumphantly led by Len and Barbara on their mobility scooters. Len died on Christmas Day 2011, and our last visit was in January 2012 for the funeral, where we performed a new dance written in, in Len's honour, and Dylan will be telling you a bit more about that dance later on. Barbara passed away in December 2014, but Len and Barbara Berry, without whom we might never have existed, are written into history and will not be forgotten. I thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. <laughs> um, there aren't any other uh, questions that have come in, so um, I'm going to pass you over now to um, Dylan, Dylan Brown, our foreman. Uh, so it's time to get your hankies ready. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Dylan Brown. Uh, I joined the side in um, uh, November 1981. Um, I'm going to be showing you um, various videos. Right. Um, yeah, like I say, I joined in uh, November 81. Um, I took uh, over from Tim Radford, the uh, foremanship of the side, um, when he emigrated to uh, America. Um, the Curtington style is pretty well defined for me for, from the reconstruction. Um, ideally, it's very angular. In the stepping, the knees and elbows uh, are quite often held at 90 degrees, in theory. Um, but then there's the problems of uh, we are all individuals of various ages, and uh, as the day goes on, the fatigue kicks in and the arms drop and the angles uh, go slightly awry. Um, but it happens as a foreman, I have to accept it, be pragmatic and remind the dancers um, to, at important times to get those angles right. Um, I'm going to be uh, showing you, first of all, the, um, uh, the stepping of the of the dances um, we won't have much time unfortunately to uh, go through the whole of the um, curtains and repertoire um, but uh, hopefully this brief taste will be useful I'll be guiding you through a uh, uh, presentation of the steps first uh, with video clips of each of them uh, and then you can have a go at uh, performing the, the steps uh, have a go uh, and if you've got any questions, um, put them into the chat and uh, fire them to uh, John. Uh, after the steps, I'll go briefly through the figures uh, for the dances, uh, again with video clips. Uh, we won't dance them as we don't have any don't don't have any sets. Um, but by showing videos of our dances, you'll get to see how they fall into the format of the dances that we do. Um, we'll then be in a position to maybe have a go at a, a dance. Um, it's perhaps worth noting that all the curtains and figures feature the same sequence of steps. So uh, uh, that makes it a bit easier. 
uh, two double steps and a hockle back each time. But um, anyway, on with the um, on with the uh, stepping. Okay. Uh, first of all, the double step. It's quite straightforward. Uh, one, two, three, hop. Um, the knees comes up on the hop, uh, as do the hands. Um, the arms are kept bent at that 90 degree angle, hopefully, and the arms swing smoothly uh, up and down. So um, here's an example. Right, um, so if you would like to have a go at uh, dancing that step, uh, don't worry if you're not inclined that way. Uh, enjoy the uh, video, I hope. Um, so if you're ready and we'll have a go. Right, that's the uh, double step. Um, fairly straightforward for any Morris dancer, but keeping those um, arms bent at 90 degrees. And note, uh, I'll just show it. Well, when you dance it, the um, hands shouldn't go much higher than eye, eye level uh, when you swing the arms. Um, so if we do it again. Right. Then we have the hockle back. Now this is uh, very particular to um, uh, the Curtinton tradition. Uh, it's a backwards step hop, step hop, feet together and jump. Um, the right leg starts the movement. Um, all our dances uh, start with uh, the right foot. Uh, well, in 95% of the cases they do. Um, the right leg swings out to the side. The knee is raised to um, and bent at 90 degrees and it's brought round as far as possible until it's in line with the body. Um, that's the theory. Uh, quite often it's difficult for people to get it round that far. Um, but the key thing is that the foot should stay in line with the leg. Uh, you do not lead with the heel. The heel should not lead uh, going backwards. Um, the arms stay up and the elbows bent at 90 degrees um, until you get to the feet together and the jump and stay on the toes so that you can keep the bounce. I'll uh, show you it first and then you can have a go at it. Right, that sequence of hocklebacks and uh, double steps represents, in effect, the foot up uh, figure at the start of uh, our dances. Uh, once to yourself of the hockleback, uh, followed by the uh, foot up of the two double steps and a hockleback. So if you're ready to have a go at that, um, here we go. Right, uh, the hockleback, uh, there I was travelling backwards a reasonable distance and usually it is uh, uh, used for travelling backwards, but there are times when, for instance, you're dancing a hay, uh, 
that um, you don't actually want to go back that far and you can almost dance it on the spot. Um, if you want to, it's, because it is a unique to Curtington, uh, I'll play that again to give you another opportunity to dance it. Um, like I say, you don't have to go back as far as I'm doing in, in that example. Uh, That's the hockle back. Then we get to the closed side step. Um, like the uh, double step, it's a one, two, three hop step. Um, with it, the leading foot steps across the trailing foot. Uh, the feet stay parallel and directed straight forwards. Um, the hands are held at uh, chest level. Um, the knuckles just about touching. Um, the body shouldn't swing to side, from side to side, but it fa stays facing straight forwards. Um, on the hop, the hands are thrown up and out and the leading foot changes. Uh, then the, um, the, yeah, the closed side step can, be, can either be danced on the spot as it is usually, um, but it can be moved, uh, can, can be used if you want to, uh, travel so it's um, quite a versatile step and it gets used quite a lot. Um, just as a side, uh, I'm not wearing bells in these examples because it would drown the music uh, and I'm not using hankies because it would get, I found they, get, it's, they started getting caught up with the, um, the, the conservatory blinds. Um, so uh, first of all I'll show you the close side step uh, and then we'll have a go at dancing it. Right, and then uh, to dance it. Right, um, yeah, the the timing of the arms going up is timed in with the uh, with the hop. Um, so I'll just do it one more time, uh, so you can get used to it. Right, that's the close side step. Now, um, slightly easier step to do the open side step. Um, it's either open side step left or right. Um, the leading foot uh, steps out to the side. The trailing foot follows it, um, but touch the ground behind the, the leading foot. Um, it's a simple step uh, and easy to do, but if you want to transition from an open side step to um, say, for example, uh, a double step or, um, or to plain capers, uh, if, you've, if, you're, if you've been doing an open side step right, you will have to throw in a fudge step, otherwise you'll be on the wrong foot. Um, the leading hand is held out in the direction of travel um, and it rotates uh, as if you're doing an underarm, underarm delivery of a ball. Uh, the other arm is um, kept held in the small of the back. Um, like uh, a lot of dances, it's uh, a lot easier to do than it is to actually describe. So if we watch it, uh, this example. <laughs>
Right, uh, so if you're ready, we'll uh, just dance that step. Oh, sorry. And we'll do that one again. Um, hopefully it works this time. Right, now, as you may have seen just now, we're going on to the plain caper. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's one of these steps where you keep your arms bent at 90 degrees, um, hands uh, uh, up when the right foot goes up and they're down when the left foot goes down. Um, trying to put spring into the step gives you more time to uh, um, make the caper look good. Um, I'll just show you the example uh, before we do it. Right, um, the dance that we'll be doing uh, later uh, involves capers, so we'll give you a couple of uh, opportunities to uh, practice this step. Note the uh, um, steady movement of the arms up and down uh, with the steps. It sh they shouldn't be flicked at all. Right, uh, that's the plain caper and now uh, the slow or upright caper that we have. Um, Right, this uh, four elements to, to, the, to this step. Uh, there's a step forwards, uh, the feet are then brought together, ready for the jump, and then there's a recover, which is more of a bounce. Uh, to, but the recover, if you are trying to cover quite a lot of ground, like you might be in uh, truncles, uh, the recover can be used for covering some more, uh, some more ground. Uh, you lead with the right foot first and in the jump the right foot goes forwards and the left goes backwards and then the next step the left foot leads forwards you jump with the left foot forwards and the right foot goes back the hands are kept down by the side until you get ready for the um, during the feet together they start to wind up ready for the jump when the hands go straight up um, and then they come down again when you land. Simple as that. Um, yeah, this step has problem. Well, I'll, I'll show you what it goes like first. Here we go. <laughs> Right, as you can see, those jumps, um, when you're dancing, they can cause problems with um, knee and ankle injuries. Um, something that you have to watch out for. Um, and you can't really do the, um, the step on the spot. You do have to travel. Um, so if you want to give it a go, um, try not to uh, kick the cat or uh, knock over any tables. Um, and here we go. Right, 
uh, that's yeah, it's quite a typical um, uh, step for Curtinton. Um, I'd like to say that when I was doing that, I was having to limit how high I was jumping because my, otherwise my feet would hit the ceiling. But um, if you want to have another go, um, here we are. Right, that's the uh, slow or upright caper, and that was the last of the steps I was going to show you. Um, right, we'll now go on to the um, uh, the figures. Right, now then, um, the foot up. We call it the foot up. Actually, um, what it really refers to is a once to yourself at the beginning of the dance of a hockle back. Uh, the foot up proper is um, two double steps, one traveling forwards and the second one on the spot, followed by a hockle back. Uh, that gets uh, repeated. Um, uh, if we show you, You'll, well, I'll just say that during the uh, rest of the um, uh, show, uh, we'll be going through um, three of the dances. So you'll get to see how the, uh, the figures uh, work with the uh, dance formats. So um, I'll just show these uh, clips once uh, as you'll get to see them several times during the afternoon. Okay. Actually, right, okay. Um, that's the foot up. The next um, uh, figure that we do in a dance is the half jip. Um, this is danced by numbers one and two first before the rest of the set join in. Uh, in these examples, it's probably best to watch uh, numbers one and two uh, so that you get the uh, full impact of the, um, of the figure. Um, the first double step brings the dancers right shoulder to right shoulder. They then do the second double step on the spot uh, and then hockle back into position with the rest of the set joining in on the jump. With the all these figures really, the first movement um, on the first double step, you cover most of the ground. The second double step will be done on the spot. So I'll just show you um, the half jip. Uh, like I say, if you watch uh, number one and two to see how it's done. <laughs> Uh, that's the half chip. The next figure is the face to face. Um, okay, now with the face to face, all the dancers join in together with this. Uh, so they all dance it simultaneously. Um, on the first double step, you're trying to move around the uh, opposite dancer. Um, the second double step is done facing each other um, as close as you can uh, and then you hockle back to the opposite side of the set. Uh, with all these figures it's important to try to keep lines uh, so there's an element of um, keeping uh, an eye on uh, out the corner of your eye on the rest of the set. So I might show this uh, this particular figure a couple of times.
as I've pointed out before, the um, uh, the stepping is the same as the foot up. It's two double steps and the hockle back. So I'll just show it to you again. And then after the face-to-face, -face, we come to the back-to-back. -back. Um, again, like the um, like the half jip, the top couple perform this first. Um, the rest join in on the jump of the hockle back. Uh, the first double step is performed trying to get round the opposite dancer, uh, moving past each other and moving uh, pass each other back to back as close as you can. Uh, the second double step is performed with the right shoulder, uh, with left shoulder to left shoulder uh, before the hockle back into position. And uh, I'll just show this to you. Right, and then we the next figure is the Kirtlington Hay. Um, this is quite unique uh, to the side, um, quite different from uh, a lot of uh, other hays. Um, with this one, I'll just describe it very briefly uh, before analysing it in more detail. Um, one and dancers one and two move backwards down the outside of the set uh, before turning. Uh, numbers three and four move forwards and between numbers one and two and then they circle round and back to where they started. Uh, five and six move backwards through the set before uh, turning in, out and around and at the end of the double steps the, um, the six dancers uh, should ideally form a circle. Uh, to get that circle, it's actually quite important for numbers three and four to see um, how the other four dancers uh, have um, have managed to do during the uh, double steps. Because if three and four go in too close um, to the rest of the set, you lose that circle and you end up with um, uh, a weird sort of oblong shape. Um, so it is quite important for numbers three and four to get get it right. Um, and then after the double steps, the the dancers um, they uh, move to their positions. Uh, quite often, uh, dancers use a half hay, which is just the once. But usually, at the end of a dance, you'll get the whole hay. Uh, I'll show it to you once. Uh, and then I'll do a bit more analysis of it, as you'll see. Hopefully. Right, so that was a whole hay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video again, but I'm going to try and uh, slow it down and dan and go through each of the pairs of dance dancers so you can see what they're really doing. Uh, hopefully this will work. Um, we'll give it a go. Right. So if we watch uh, dancers number one and two to start off with, uh, you can see them going backwards, turning outwards, and then back in towards the set, ready to do the hockle back. So that's numbers one and two. Then we'll watch numbers three and four. Three and four move forwards um, between numbers uh, one and two, and they turn, follow them round, out, 
them back into the set. Now, quite often you get the inexperienced dancers put into the positions three and four because it's a lot easier to dance the hay from that position. But as you can see, um, it is important for three and four to be positioned correctly so you keep that circle. Um, and then probably the numbers five and six, uh, they're the ones who have to have faith in the rest of the side because they, at the start of the hay, they jump into the middle, turn their backs to everybody, and then move backwards through the set. Ideally, they're right on the heels of three and four, uh, and they turn out and round, and then everybody does the hockle back into position. Okay, and then I'll just release it so you can see the, the next half. Okay, um, now we'll um, show you the Kirtlington eight man hay. Uh, this, uh, the best example I could find of this was actually at um, one of our practice nights. Uh, this will give you an opportunity, uh, our opportunity to show that we're not all old. The, there is a, a young dancer in there called Charlie. Uh, you'll be able to spot him because he's the one who's still got spring in his step. Um, the hay, uh, with the eight man hay, no, it's simply numbers seven and eight added to uh, the six man hay, and they just follow through numbers five and six, uh, traveling forwards through the set. Uh, one thing to note is that there is a slight difference in that the center of gravity is no longer between dancers three and four, it's between three, four, five, and six. That means that when five and six go backwards through the set, they don't actually travel as far as they would do normally with uh, a six man hay. Uh, and also because you've got more dancers involved in the set, you can't really form a, a circle. There isn't the, the time uh, to do it. So it, it, the set forms more of um, an oval shape. Uh, this dance, that I'm going to show you. It's actually the middle chorus of um, uh, a dance called Joan Collins, eight man stick dance. Um, so uh, it starts off with uh, face to face and finish, finishes with the start of the uh, back to back. Um, but inside uh, that chorus, you'll get to see two eight man half haze. So uh, if I can find Right. Right, okay. Um, I think that's the last of the um, figures. Um, right. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh, now we'll actually get to see uh, a, a full dance in um, in practice. Um, right, uh, th this first dance that we'll show you is um, a stick dance called Forest Feathers. Um, Curtinton have got about 33 dances in total. Um, around 12 of the dances have been uh, discovered or rediscovered since uh, 1996 and of the total about a third of them are actually stick dances. Um, this 
first dance, um, Forest Feathers, was actually known as Stick Dance Number One. Uh, first of all, you'll notice that we take our take off our hats for dancing, and they get stacked in front of the musician as a hat tree. Uh, it avoids them getting knocked off in the dance. And this view is actually from the top of the hat tree. <laughs> You'll see that the sticks are held in the uh, right hand about six inches from the end. Uh, and when dancing the double step or doing plain capers, the stick is held upright and stationary. In the hockleback, uh, as you'll see, the, the stick is brought up above the head and is held in both hands. Uh, you'll see this in the video. Um, with this particular dance, the sticking may seem stayed and unadventurous. Uh, the reason for this is that the revived side used rail cut down um, shortened uh, railway shunting poles uh, from the local cement works uh, for their sticking. Uh, these sticks, they were quite thick uh, and shorter the, than the ones we use today, and they were nigh on indestructible. Uh, in fact, uh, it took about seven years of hard work before we actually got one of them to break. Uh, the records that I have show that that particular stick in question was broken by uh, Messrs Tim Radford and uh, Simon Escott in July 87. So yes, it took about seven years for one of those sticks to break. Um, of note in this video, uh, that I'm going to show you is uh, the dancer at number six, uh, who's Andy Giles, who's a member of the uh, original revival side in 1979, uh, when he was one of the scouts that was recruited as a dancer. Uh, he usually returns for La Mail. Uh, this particular recording, I think, was about 2013. Um, the, the, Dance is quite helpful in that it shows it's typical in that you get nearly all the uh, figures uh, that I've just shown you in the correct sequence and you see them in relationship to the uh, choruses. Um, so uh, I'll just check the sound. Yep. And here we go. Forest Feathers. <laughs> Well done. Right, um, now we'll uh, go on to the second uh, of uh, the dances. Um, 
This is uh, going to be Len Berry, and this will this dance will be the one that you can have a go at dancing uh, if you want to give it a go. Um, what I'm going to do first of all is show you the uh, uh, initial foot up and the chorus so that you can see uh, how it goes uh, before I go into a bit more explanation of uh, the background to the dance and the uh, and then we'll uh, dance it properly. So um, uh, it's quite loud this one. So um, this is uh, Squire Len Berry. Right, um, so th this dance, um, it's named after our first squire of the Revive side, uh, Len Berry. Uh, we had actually started uh, creating the dance uh, just before he unfortunately passed away. Uh, and we worked to get it ready for the first performance at his funeral. Uh, this video is actually recorded at the Chippenham Folk Festival, which is organized by uh, Bob Berry, uh, uh, his son. Uh, the tune was written and given to us by Chris Leslie, uh, the brother of John Leslie, a um, musician. Uh, of note in the, uh, in the video, uh, you get to see our animal, Elmo the Griffin. Uh, he was given to the side by Paul Davenport, who uh, revived the side. Uh, Paul carved the head in the same style as the Green Oak Morris Dragon. Uh, that dragon was carved out of oak. Uh, Elmo is carved out of that now rare wood, elm, uh, hence uh, the name Elmo. Um, like Forest Feathers, which I've just shown you, um, this is another half hay dance for six dancers. Um, has the usual sequence of figures uh, and chorus. Uh, the steps, uh, double steps, Hocklebacks and plain capers are used in, in the dance, so it's not particularly uh, challenging in that sense. Um, the chorus is six double steps facing up the set, then four plain capers uh, capering round, uh, and then going into a half hay, uh, which is then, uh, that is then repeated. Uh, each set, uh, of six double steps starts with dance in number one position, uh, stepping into the center and then turning towards the musician. Um, then on the second double step, the opposite dancer joins in on the left foot. Uh, all the dancers join in one at a time until number six just has to do the one double step before the capering and the half hay. The reason the double steps always face the musician is that so that in the second half of the chorus, uh, dancers number one and two actually get to have a bit of a breather. They'd be crippled if they were doing all the double stepping at, at, at the front. Uh, note that the dance will end with um, four capers into the middle rather than uh, the hockle back and facing up the set. Uh, I'm going to show you, uh, play the video. Uh, if you're going to dance it, I suggest you keep an eye on number three uh, and dance, uh, perform the dance as, as if you're in the number three position. Uh, if you're not going to dance it, um, then I hope you enjoy watching it. Um, look out for the, look, look out for Elmo, you can't really miss him. 
uh, he does almost get in the way of the dancers one or two times. One of the problems <clears throat> was that we were dancing on a stage, so we were a bit limited for space. Uh, it's ni nice to dance in the, the middle of a playground, but you can't have everything. Uh, so if you're ready, uh, we'll give um, Len Berry a go. We come to um, uh, a, a video of the side dancing truncles, um, our traditional dance. Th this was this particular performance was recorded at the 1991 Sidmouth uh, International Folk Festival. Um, this was our first dance on the arena stage. Uh, our musician was uh, uh, Alex Brown was a bit nervous at the time, uh, so she plays a bit too fast for us at the beginning. Um, so if the dancers appear to be a bit behind the music, it may not be the, uh, Zoom on this occasion. It might actually be the performance. Um, but at the beginning, you get to see Len Berry uh, giving us a, a round of applause. Len uh, very rarely danced in the set. Uh, sometimes he made up uh, a sixth uh, if he had to, but he was more likely to uh, act as the fool for the side 
when we're dancing. Uh, in in I, what I think is interesting in this performance is that uh, you get to see the first three foremen of the side uh, dancing. Uh, number one is um, Ian Harris, who guided us through the, the first 10 or 11 years of, of our existence. Uh, number three is our second uh, foreman, uh, Tim Radford, who led us until uh, October 96. And then uh, number two, there's me. So um, the, the apologies for the sound on this, it is very quiet and the quality uh, from 1990 one isn't uh, the best, but it is actually of uh, what's uh, a very good performance of truncles and uh, an excellent hay at the end of it. So uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, performance of truncles.
Right. Uh, that, I hope, has given you uh, a good indication of the Curtington style of dancing um, in practice. Uh, we hope to run uh, a workshop at some point uh, in the future when uh, restrictions are lifted, uh, when hopefully you'll be able to get a chance to learn some of our dances uh, properly. So um, I think uh, now's the time to hand back to uh, John in the studio. Remember to put, take myself off mute this time. Uh, thank you, Dylan. Um, we have come to the end of the presenting bit of the uh, workshop. I um, hope you've en enjoyed it and learnt uh, one or two things. I've had a couple of questions which I've dealt with in the background and Tim's added some comments um, about Elmo, which is interesting. Um, well, I've just got my builders cutting a floor tile outside. A bit noisy. We can hardly hear them. Okay, good, good, I'll carry on. So um, basically the floor's open if you've got any questions. Um, whilst you're thinking up any questions, I'd just like to say thank you for the um, presenters for giving their time and preparing their uh, presentations. And big thank you to Pauline, who's had to sit through patiently and diligently through some of our rehearsals and uh, give us some tips on Zoom, etc. Um, nice to see some people from overseas attending. Uh, I can see somebody from Utrecht there. Uh, yes, I've seen your YouTube videos of your Kirtlington dancing. Very good. Uh, thank you. And um, um, has anybody got anything they want to add? I can put up a, um, a contact information. We're, we're not... We're not the best at social media, um, if you're after <clears throat> lots of comment, but we do have a presence on um, Facebook and uh, Twitter. Our website is kept fairly up to date. There's not a lot going on at the moment, unfortunately. I think that's the same, same for everyone. Um, but we, we, we hope to see you soon at a festival or an event or a la mail at some point in the future. And thank you for attending. Can I, add, can I add a few words, John? Of course you can. Yeah, okay. Well, perhaps the most important thing to say is that we really, really, really need more members. Obviously, it's a very difficult time for everybody at the moment, but Kirtlington are really on our <coughs> efforts at, at the moment uh, with, with our numbers, as you can see, um, you know, we're, none of us in, in, in the spring of, uh, of our lives anymore, and we could really do with some new members. Please come along. Uh, obviously not just at the moment, but uh, maybe we'll, we'll, be, we'll be starting to meet again, hopefully uh, in, in May or June. And of course, uh, then there'll be the summer. And after that, we'll be starting our normal practice season in, in September. And we could, uh, we would love, love, love to see some new people coming. Uh, eight o'clock Tuesdays, Kirtlington Village Hall. And just to run through some official thank yous then. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Pauline for inviting us and guiding us through the, uh, the dreaded Zoom maze, uh, some of which uh, we've got the hang of and some of it perhaps not quite so well. Um, thanks very much to our secretary, Bob Dunlop, who, who has made us accept the invitation. Um, I know that we weren't all, all keen on it, but uh, our nerves have been overcome. Um, thanks especially to our Zoom tech, if I may call you so, uh, John Mayo, for, um, shall we say, learning on the job and then teaching us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think again, some of it, some of it has rubbed off. We're we're better we're better at Zoom, most of us than than we were before we started. Um, of course, John Leslie, the uh, the musical uh, introduction. Thank you very much, John, for that. Paul Davenport for uh, his uh, presentation on the on the early history. Uh, Tim Radford for his presentation on the slightly later history. 
And of course, last but not least, Dylan, uh, with a, a very, very accomplished uh, presentation, um, who he really has got the hang of the technology, hasn't he? That was a great presentation on, on the techniques and the, uh, and the figures and the general dancing style of Curlington Morris. So uh, an extra special thank you to, to Dylan for that. So, uh, and, uh, and of course, thank you to everybody who has, um, who has been watching this afternoon. We hope you've, uh, you've learned something. I might, I might also point out that uh, during Tim, sorry, during Dylan's uh, presentation, I was actually getting up and doing some of those steps, which is the, f the first time since last June. Because of course nobody's nobody's dancing, are they? So um, so it was quite it was quite something for me to uh, shake a leg, so to speak. So uh, thank thank you for that. Anyway, um, should we go back to any questions? I see that I've got a flag saying Philip Lemaire has raised a yes. hand. Can you handle that, John? Yes, go ahead, Philip. Hi, thank you very very much. This is an excellent presentation. Um, I'm Philip from uh, Adderbury on the Adderbury Falls. I hope, can you hear me? Are you a bit crackly? Okay, so i try this, I'll try this a bit better. Um, just thank you very much, an excellent presentation. Kirk Linton has always been part of my Morris life. Um, I, we've had a very close contact, although I've never joined you. I'm really a, a, an Apre Morris type and uh, I enjoy the pub more than I actually do the dancing, but nevertheless, it's just one thought I've always had on my mind is um, when you were first picking, um, choosing the colours for your kit, I've always felt the colours were a little bit faded. And did you take the colours from the museum and had the sunlight been shining on it for a bit too long and they got faded? Because <laughs> my feeling was that in those days they would have um, perhaps used stronger colours. I believe our colours are based on the Dashwood Racing Silk colours of the Dashwood family. Yes, they are. The Dashwood family colours are pink and blue. There you go. Thank you. Often to be seen at sunset. That explains it. Thank you. <laughs> the observation that they are faded, of course, is almost certainly also true. Well, we don't. And they, be, and they become more faded as the years go by. <laughs> Indeed. Anything else from the floor? Sean? I have a question. Yes. Um, my name is Jan Elliot. I'm Hello, Jan. And I used to play for Kirtlington for a yeah. few years when we lived over there. And I loved uh, John Leslie's music. And I loved hearing Alex, with whom I sometimes played. Um, mm. Could you remind us of the other musicians that you've had on the team through the Ooh, years? Yes. Um, um, Andy Shane from violin. Yes. Hey, I've <laughs> done it for years. <laughs> oh, Vin. <Yeah. laughs> can you play one tune? It's the same one I can play. <laughs> <laughs> no, me. I used to play. Oh, them. yes, oh, you did. Yeah. yeah. But I did them very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Diane Valerius played Melodia. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, Diane, of course. Yes. yes. Gar North. Gary Honor has played for us. And yeah. Bob? And Gary Honor. Yeah. Me a bit. Another, another fiddler. And Charlie, our youngest member, plays clarinet for us. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Debbie Roberts, forget, don't forget. Oh, yes, Debbie. Oh, yes, Debbie, yes. Yeah. Yes. Andy Cheney as well played fiddle for several years. Yeah, he didn't mention. Yeah. yeah, he was playing for the... Yeah, uh, I managed figures. to remember him. Yeah, he wrote a and, couple of our tunes. Mm -hmm. And yes, currently, yes. Sue Smith is learning. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you include Pete North? North? I missed North. that. Oh, yeah, Pete North. Pete North. North. North, yeah. There's been a lot of musicians. Oh, how do we get through so many, do you think? <laughs> a lot of tunes. Have to all just share them all out, so we know we've got. Some that, yeah, we're we sharing the load. That's that's what we call it. Yeah. Oh yeah, and Tim Hobbs. Yeah. Tim Hobbs. Yeah. Yeah, and of I course like Barbara. I like the border terrier. I, I was wanted to ask, how were the were the basic stepping reconstructed, or was it cons constructed? 
Ah, well, over to you, Tim. Uh, how was the basic stepping? Well, the basic stepping was just me teaching double steps and single steps into the huckleback, really, using yeah. Paul's notes and my experience. Um, something different. <laughs> if I can yeah. add in on that, the angular movements are as described by Cecil Sharp yeah. when he saw the Kirtlington Truncles and um, uh, a, a jockey demonstrated in 1922 by William Pearman. Um, the hay was a Paul Davenport invention, which he describes as serendipity. No, um, I, I, dis to work. I disagree with you, Bob. The, oh, hay, yeah. the hay was worked out by the team at the time. Of the okay. And we didn't do what Paul Davenport wanted us to do. Okay, thank you. I only had Paul's word for it. We changed it. In fact, he didn't like what we did when he first saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Kirtlington performed at the Marlboro Morris Ale in 1990, and they did Trunkles, and it was a cloudy day, but as they went into the hay at the very end of the dance, the sun came out, and the audience oh, yeah. went wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I can remember dancing at um, Bampton in uh, 1982, uh, dancing Trunkles, and I think it was the first time a lot of uh, Morris dancers had seen Kirtlington dance, and I remember uh, at the end of the hay, uh, there was a big cheer went up from everyone, <laughs> it, because it, it was quite a... a it was a very different hay uh, than uh, other sides were familiar with. Uh, it was it was well impressive. received. Yeah. If you look at if you can find early videos of green oak dancing the hay, you'll see that it's different. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. Right. On the subject of sticking. Um, I I was looking at the original notes in the black book. And it says danced with straight leg. So I wondered why the decision had been made to dance it with a knee up, knee up on the double step. Um, it's all too long ago. <laughs> blame me if you want. <laughs> yeah. Which black book has got a description of sticking in it? There's no stick dances in Kirklington in the black book. Doomsday book. When I, when I talked to the team originally, there were no stick dances. The stick dances were created in the period after the, after the revival, before I came back in 85. And I think most of them were Ian Harris's um, invention, the stick dances. Because there were no stick dances when they taught the team. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but that's been magnificent. Thank you very much to Kurt Linton, and I've really enjoyed the rehearsals as well, honestly. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, if you'd like to give a round of applause to everyone who's presented today, that'd be great if you could unmute yourself. Thank you. And uh, any donations gratefully received to uh, prostate cancer. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Nigel? Yes, it certainly is. Well done. Yeah, thank you.